All right, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, several years ago, our family went to uh, Kailua, Kona, Hawaii for a family vacation. Uh, we arrived in the middle of the night, so we couldn't exactly see much and appreciate the, the beauty of the place. But when we woke up in the morning and looked out at the ocean, that was just 100 feet from the house that we're, where we were staying, and saw the, the sun streaming in through the palm trees, it was simply majestic. Now, now we could look at that and, and naturally conclude that all of it was the result of a creator God and not simply a matter of chance. Now, when you realize that there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on a beach in Hawaii, we cannot conclude that all of this happened by accident. As a classic illustration, if, if you were to find a watch washed up on the beach, you would naturally conclude what? You would conclude that there was a watch maker. That even though you weren't around to see the watch being made, you could look at the watch and know that it had a designer. And the same is true for creation. Now, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they're without excuse. Uh, have you ever heard someone say, or, or maybe you've even said this yourself, if only God would give me a sign, then I would believe. Well, it's as though God is saying to us, I have made my power and my goodness and my grace known to you in the things that I have made. If only your eyes were open. If only our eyes were open. Uh, this morning, we come again to Genesis chapter one. Uh, last week, we looked at the first two verses. Uh, today, we will begin looking at the six days of creation. Uh, we could spend months going through Genesis chapter 1, drawing out the different things in this chapter, but uh, we're only going to spend two weeks on the rest of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, as you read Genesis chapter 1, you see that it is perfectly divided so that the first three days of creation describe the forming of the earth, and then the, the last three days of creation describe the filling of the earth. As one commentator put it, uh, the two sets of days are a direct echo and remedy to the opening statement that the earth was without form and void. The earth's formlessness was remedied by its forming on days one to three, and its emptiness by its filling on days four to six. And, and so this is the, the way that we'll be looking at the six days of creation. We'll look at the, the forming of the earth today, and then we will look at the filling of the earth next week. And my hope is that uh, we will have our eyes open to the power and the goodness and the grace of our creator God. So if you have your Bibles open, follow along with me as I read Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 to 13. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and 
separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. May God bless the reading of his word. Uh, through the centuries, Christians who have held that the scriptures are inerrant, that is, without error, have differed over the interpretation of the six days of creation. There are those who believe that the Bible teaches that creation took place in six 24-hour days, and there are those who believe that the six days of Genesis did not limit God's creating abilities, creating actions, to the 144 hours of six days. There are godly men and women who have given their lives to uh, God's word who have differed over the opening verses of the Bible. But what they have not differed on is the truth of God's word and that the Genesis account is factual and historical. This means that we must be cautious and humble as we approach God's word and that we say no more and no less than what scripture says. Uh, people often say that Genesis is not a science textbook and that we should therefore not take the Genesis account of creation too seriously. But while that's true that the language we see throughout the, the first chapter of Genesis is not technical and, and detailed, like what we would find in a science textbook, it does not follow, it does not mean that the account of Genesis is untrue or unfactual. Uh, you see, what we have before us is called historical narrative. In other words, we're not in the realm of make-belief. We're not talking about Wizards and hobbits and dwarves and fawns here. If we were to, to look at, at ancient Near Eastern literature, that, that's the kind of thing that we would find. We would read about gods and goddesses fighting one another and, and, and killing one another. And, that, and how out of this struggle, the world was created. But we read something different when we come to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, to give you a, a technical Hebrew term, uh, we have in these verses what is called a vav consecutive plus an imperfect verb. A vav consecutive plus an imperfect verb. Now, what on earth does that mean? And what relevance does it have for my life? That might be the question you're asking. Well, in our English translation, this shows up in the words... And God said, or, and it was so, or, and God called, and there was morning, and there was evening. Uh, what we see throughout Genesis chapter 1 is this, this vav consecutive plus an imperfect verb. And why this matters is because this was the normal Hebrew way of writing history. Throughout the Old Testament, this, this was the way of telling what actually happened. 
It's like saying, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. There's a, there's a pattern here. And so what we have before us is not myth. It's not a fable. It is the historical account of creation. Moses, the author, is, is presenting the creation story as something that actually happened. This would have been how Moses' hearers would have understood the days of creation. They wouldn't have understood it as a myth. They, they would have understood it as, as history, as their history. The creation story was a direct attack on the pagan mythologies of the surrounding nations. Uh, one commentator writes, each day of creation attacks one of the gods in the, the pagan pantheons of the day and describes how they are not really gods at all. Uh, on day one, the gods of light and darkness are dismissed. On day two, the gods of sky and sea. On day three, the, the earth god and, and gods of vegetation. On day four, the sun and moon and star gods. Days five and six, dispersed with the idea of divinity within the animal kingdom. Finally, it is made clear that humans and humanity are not divine, while also teaching that all from the greatest to the least are made in the image of God. Uh, Genesis 1 then is the literal history of what God did when he created the heavens and the earth. Now, obviously, it's, it's not meant to be an exhaustive account of, of creation. After all, it's, it's only one page long. And look, look at all. All of God's creation around us. But what Genesis 1 does is it describes for us that God created everything in six days. And he created it in a specific order. He created it in six days and he created it in a specific order. So let's, let's look at these first three days of creation one by one in greater detail. Uh, first, look at day one in verses three to five. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. <coughs> uh, notice that God is so powerful that he merely speaks and creation comes into existence, right? God said, let there be light. And light came shooting out at 299,792,458 meters per second. God creates with such ease and such joy. Uh, C.S. Lewis attempted to capture God's ease and joy in creation in the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, in the book, The Magician's Nephew, Aslan created the world of Narnia by singing. You maybe know the, the book. With each step, the singing lion took with its large paws, trees and mountains and animals and rivers and flowers and all sorts of lovely things were bursting forth into existence until finally all was created. Narnia had been created by the voice of the lion. Such ease and such joy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Helena and I ordered uh, patio furniture from Home Depot, which arrived at our door this week. And in this, in this big box was everything we needed to put it all together, right? Including an instruction booklet because I'm not God. I can't just create something out of nothing. But even with all the pieces, all the bolts and, and even the instructions, 
Helena can confirm that I did not put it together with ease or with joy. <laughs> but God does not struggle to create. In Psalm 29, we read that the voice of the Lord is over the waters. That the voice of the Lord is powerful. That the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. That the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. That the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. That the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. And that the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. Psalm 29 verse 10 concludes by saying, that the Lord sits enthroned as king forever. And that is exactly what we see in Genesis chapter 1. We see a king. In ancient times, kings were the law of the land. The king spoke and it was done. Sound familiar? Genesis chapter 1 portrays God as the king of the universe. His word is powerful. He speaks and it is done. He commands and it happens. He wills and it comes to pass. When God says, let there be light, the light isn't thinking to itself, should I exist or shouldn't I exist? <laughs> no, the light has no choice but to exist because our God is the sovereign king of the universe. Nothing on earth happens apart from his will. There is no such thing as a chance happening. He creates and controls the universe by his powerful word. And who is this word of God? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. When the Apostle John begins his gospel, he identifies Jesus Christ as the word of God through whom all things were made. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, he writes, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I just listened to Liam quote this passage this morning. Jesus Christ was there in the beginning. He is one with the sovereign creator God. He is the word of God through whom the world was created and through whom the world will be redeemed. Where do we see this? Well, in John chapter 11, Jesus stands in front of the tomb of Lazarus and he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And do you know what happens? It says that the man who had died came out. Well, go figure. Because do you think that Lazarus was in there thinking, should I come back to life and, and come out or shouldn't I? No, Lazarus had no choice but to come back to life. Why? Because Jesus is the sovereign king of the universe. Whose word is powerful, who speaks and it is done, who commands and it happens, who wills and it comes to pass. We see this in the fact that for the first three days of creation, light shone from a source other than the sun. That wasn't that interesting. And don't you also find it interesting that the Bible begins and ends with light but no sun? Revelation 22 verse 5 says, And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For... The Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, why is that significant? Well, because Jesus himself calls himself the light of the world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, saying, Whoever 
follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, that's an audacious claim to make as Jesus speaks these words, right? He's standing in the temple treasury by the massive extinguished torches that had burned the very night before in the illumination of the temple ceremony, which celebrated the Shekinah glory that led Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. In other words, Jesus is declaring that he is the giver of light in Genesis chapter 1. And indeed, Revelation 21 verse 23 says of Jesus, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So if, if you are a Christian here this morning then this is exactly what Jesus has done in you. At some point in your life, maybe you were a child, maybe you were an adult. At some point in your life, God spoke into your life. And when there was no faith, he gave you faith. When there was darkness, he gave you light. When there was death, he gave you life. He spoke into your dark heart, let there be light, and there was light. Praise God that he creates and controls the universe by his powerful word. That he resurrects dead hearts and draws people to himself. Notice in verse 4 that God separates the light from the darkness. Right? Separation as a creative activity of God is actually a key theme in this chapter. Uh, we read that God also separated the, the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse in verse 7. And, and we also read the they separated the day from the night in verse 14. And then there's also the, the fundamental distinction of man as, as male and female. There's this separation of a man into two distinct persons. Uh, when sin enters the world, mankind will be separated from God. Male and female will be separated from one another. And, and Adam and Eve will be separated from, from the Garden of Eden. But here, God is doing the good work of separating. And it is a good work. As God declares that the light was good. You see, God's like an artist who steps back from his painting to admire his handiwork. What God has created is good and will accomplish that for which he has purposed. After separating the light from the darkness, it says that God called the light day and the darkness he called night. God is the one who names persons and things, which is why it is so significant that later on in chapter 2, we will see God give this ability to name things to the man who will act as God's vice regent over all of creation. And then finally, we read that there was evening and there was morning the first day. This refrain of evening and morning will be repeated after each of the six days of creation. And the question that naturally comes is, well, what is, the, what is meant by the word day? Uh, the Hebrew word here is yam, which normally refers to a regular 24-hour day. Again, there, there are godly men and women who disagree on what this word is referring to here in Genesis chapter 1. But I, I think there are good reasons to suggest that Yom is referring to a regular 24-hour day. And I'll just give a couple reasons for that. The first reason is the fact that morning and evening are mentioned. On the first day of creation, we are introduced to the cycle of darkness and light. Even though there, there is no sun or moon until day four, God is introducing us to the pattern of a day consisting of darkness and light. So there's a cycle here that we should be aware of. And then secondly, whenever a number is used with the word day, as in the first day or the second day or, or so on, which occurs often throughout the, the Old Testament, 
I'll say, I think some like 300, 400 times. It's not referring to a metaphorical day, like as in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, which says that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. But rather, it almost always refers to a regular 24-hour day. And, and since this is historical narrative, right, we're reading this, this through the, the lens of it being the historical account of creation, it, this is Moses telling us what actually happened. It would make sense that Moses would tell us that God created everything in six 24-hour days. And so that's, that's day one of creation. Now look at day two of creation, in verses six to eight. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let us separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. There's that refrain. Now notice that, that day two begins with the same phrase in, in verse one, and God said. In fact, this phrase, and God said, is used 10 times in Genesis chapter 1, which I don't think is a coincidence. Uh, you see, throughout Scripture, the number 10 signifies a, a, a kind of completeness. So there are 10 commandments, which reflect the completeness of God's holiness and, and his authority. There are 10 horns on the first beast in Revelation chapter 13, which reflect the completeness of its evil. There are ten plagues, which reflect the completeness of God's judgment. And here, in Genesis chapter 1, there are ten words, which reflect the completeness of God's creation. So, so we see that there are some similarities in, to, uh, to day one of creation, the phrase, and God said. But do you notice something missing on day two, as I read it? There's no declaration from God that what he created was good. Now, that's, that's interesting. But it's not because God created something not good, because we know that everything God creates, he creates good. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it concludes the six days of creation with God looking at everything he had made and declaring that it was very good. Instead, Maybe what we're seeing here is that it is not yet what God created it to be. And the reason I say that is because of the word expanse in verse 6. Uh, one commentator writes, the, the word expanse, rachia, uh, signifies a kind of horizontal area extending through the very heart of the mass of water and dividing it into two layers, one above the the other, creating upper and, and lower layers of water. In other words, the expanse, which God calls heaven, and what could also be translated as sky, so in other words, the, the blue that we see, is what separates the water above, which would be in the clouds, from the water below, that will eventually become lakes and rivers and oceans on day three. What, what separates the, the water coming from the clouds and the water here on the earth is called the expanse. It's the heavens. It's the sky. And, and, and that is why it is not yet good, because it is not yet what God has created it to be. He needs to, to form the, the waters into what he wants it to be, and then he'll declare that it is good. During the, the first two days of creation, God had brought increasing form and order to creation. The, the earth, warmed by lights, was now robed in blue and speckled with clouds over a sparkling sea. The picture reminds me of the first morning in Hawaii. It's, it's all so detailed and so, so beautiful. But God isn't done. He speaks twice on day three. Look at part one on day three in verses nine to 10. 
And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were together, he called seas. Ah, and there it is. And God saw that it was good. Although there is no new creation here, God completes the forming of the earth. The world as we know it has been given its shape. The destructive powers of chaos and darkness that we saw in, in verse 2 have disappeared by the powerful word of God. But with his second word on the third day, God begins creating living things, speaking plant life into existence. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. Look at part two of day three in verses 11 to 13. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. So here we see the, the gods of earth and vegetation are, are powerfully dismissed. <laughs> you might be thinking, it's just plants. Right? I, I don't even like salads anyway. Who cares? God cares. Right? God is showing that he is the king of the universe. Not some idol. Not some false god. He has given everything the power to reproduce according to its kind. Not the gods of fertility. He is the king of the universe. Excuse me. Uh, apart from the, the obvious opposition of, of pagan mythology that worshipped creatures and the sun and the moon and, and the various astrological deities and the, the gods of, of life and fertility, uh, Genesis 1 also opposes atheism because there is a God. It opposes polytheism because there is only one God. It opposes pantheism because the creation is not God. It opposes humanism because man is not God. It opposes macro evolution because the world and its creature, creatures came into being by intelligent design. It opposes naturalism because what we can see and hear and taste and touch and smell is not all there is. Genesis 1 opposes all of that. Bereshit, Barah, Elohim, et Hashemaim, the et Haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is God, and there is no other. This is made explicitly clear in Job chapter 38, verses 4 to 11, where God says to Job, Where were you <laughs> when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut, this, it, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Who? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is God. God has dismissed the power, the destructive powers of chaos with his powerful word. But this does not mean that the powers of chaos can no longer affect the earth. Right? It's not all bliss on the earth. Yes, God separated the waters above from the waters below, but God could withdraw his powerful word as he did, as we'll see later in, in the great flood 
when all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened and when all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and livestock and beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind, according to Genesis 7, verses 11 and 21. You know, yes, God relegated darkness to the night, but he could withhold the light and allow the darkness to rule again as he did with the ninth plague in Egypt when Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. And they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived, according to Exodus 10, verses 22 to 23. But, but, even though this doesn't necessarily mean that the powers of chaos no longer affect the earth, but we have nothing to fear because in his covenant faithfulness, God protects his creatures. And every morning, every morning, he drives out the darkness with his radiant light. In his book, Providence, John Piper describes seeing the rising sun as part of the God-entranced world. He writes, I used to look at sunrises when I was jogging and think that God was, has created a beautiful world. Then it became less general and more specific, more personal. I said, every morning, God paints a different sunrise. He never gets tired of doing it again and again. But then it struck me. No, he doesn't do it again and again. He never stops doing it. The sun is always rising somewhere in the world. God guides the sun 24 hours every day and paints sunrises at every moment, century after century, without one second of respite and never grows weary or less thrilled with the work of his hands. Even when cloud cover keeps man from seeing it, God is painting spectacular sunrises above the clouds. This is our God. And we are met with this God in the person of Jesus Christ. Just as God brought order out of chaos in creation, so also Christ brings order out of the chaos of our lives. If your life is dark and desolate, if your life is out of control, if there is no light in your life, or if there seems to be no hope, Look to Jesus Christ. The very same power that flung the stars out into the unfathomable, expanding universe and that orchestrated life and the complexity of the cells in your body will act on your behalf if you come to him. He will turn your night into day. He will bring form out of your chaos. It's what he does. Jesus is the son of God, the savior of the world, the one through whom the stars were created and the cells were ordered. The one through whom every sunrise is painted. The one who came and died on the cross for your sins and who rose from the dead in victory over sin and death. This this is our God. Only he can save you. Only he can make you a new creation. Only he can grant you eternal life and light. He formed the world. And he can reform you as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. Uh, we pray uh, that you would make sense of all this information. Uh, you are truly beautiful and altogether lovely. We see that in the things that you have made and, and in your care for each one of us. You are 
our creator and redeemer and sustainer. We give you all praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.